Hey, if you've got your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn with me to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 21. If you're not familiar with where the book of Genesis is at, is at in your Bible, very first book of your Bible, Genesis chapter 21. We have been navigating through this series that we just have one more week today, and then we'll be wrapping up. And I want to encourage you, don't miss out on next week, because it is the culmination of Abraham's life, and everything is leading to this pivotal moment and this decision that he has. So you won't want to miss next week's message. But we've been navigating through this series entitled A Faith-Fueled Journey, and we've been looking at this man, Abraham, and discovering how he has had some, uh, some incredible moments of tremendous faith and some deep moments where he has failed and he has sinned, and I think that gives us hope for all of us that uh, you, your journey doesn't have to be perfect. As a matter of fact, it won't be, and that we're all on this journey together and that there can be some highs and there can be some lows, and at the end of the day, that our heartbeat would be we want to pursue God. So in this moment, I just want you to go back and rewind the clock with me for just a little bit. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody made you a promise that they didn't keep? Anybody here? Anybody at all? Okay. And uh, let me just propose some, because not all of you raised your hands, to maybe remind you of some things that you didn't want to admit to, right? Maybe for some of us, we grew up in a household where you had parents for being really candid, and they made you some promises, they told you things like, oh, I'll make it to your game, or I'll get you this gift, or we'll take this trip, or we'll go on that fishing adventure, or I'll get you those dance shoes, or whatever that may be in your life. And if you're really honest with yourself, you're like, man, that was a promise that was broken. Maybe in grade school, if you go way, way back and you remember that girl or that guy that you really had a crush on, right, and you told your friend, and they said, I promise I won't tell anybody. And as you're sitting in class, you see your friend writing a note and giving it to the very person that you were just talking to them about and says, so-and-so has a crush on you, right? And you're like, how could you do that? Or maybe it gets a little bit older and the same thing happens in, in high school, maybe in college, maybe later on you share some deep personal things with a close friend. And they in turn say, you know what, your secret is safe with me only to find out that's been shared with other people other people. Anybody been in those situations? You want to raise your hand now? Maybe there's a few of us in this room that on your wedding day, you made some vows to one another, some promises, and somebody didn't keep their end of the bargain for rich or for poor or for sickness and in health till death do us part. Maybe for some of us, it's you as a parent, and you've got a kid that for the fourth time has said, maybe even in the last week, I promise I will never do that again. And they just keep doing it over and over. How about that former friend that owed you some money, kept saying they were going to pay it back. Did you catch that former friend? You, you, you know what I'm talking about here. Oh, I'll give it back, I'll give it back. And the phone stopped ringing. The relationship fell apart because the promises of the money that was supposed to be returned never happened. And we can go down a list of a multitude of things. We've all experienced it. And if we're honest, most of us have probably made some promises in our lives that we didn't end up keeping ourselves. And today, we're going to be looking through and navigating through a portion of Abraham's life where a promise that seems to have gone unfulfilled for roughly 25 years is finally coming to fulfillment. In Abraham's perspective, he probably would have said, is this ever really going to happen? And just the last couple of weeks, we navigated through his journey where God showed up and said to him, hey, this is the time and this is the deal. The promise that I made back to you way back then is now coming to fulfillment. And we're going to talk about the one who will never break his promise his name is Jesus Christ. He is promised. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change like shifting shadows, and he does not lie. And today we're going to talk about the promises of God and the insights that we can find in regards to those promises. So if you've got your Bibles open, Genesis chapter 21 is where we find ourselves in this culminating moment of the promise finally being fulfilled. Starting Genesis chapter 21, verse 1, these are the words. And let me just actually pause for just a brief moment in case you're brand new with us and what's going on and where we're going to be reading. In Genesis chapter 12, and I encourage you, you can read through Abraham's story. Genesis chapter 12, God comes to Abraham and he says, hey, I want you to leave your people, I want you to leave your father's household, and I want you to go to a land that you don't even know about right now, but I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you all the details, I'm going to give that land to you, you just got to trust me. And Abraham in faith does that. Along the journey and over the course of the next couple of years, Abraham makes some tremendously poor decisions, just like we all do. He heads to a place called Egypt, spends 
some time there. When he's not really supposed to be there, he leaves because there's a famine in his land. He lies a little bit to the Pharaoh. Some things erupt out of that. He has a moment where he tries to shortcut God's plan. He ends up having a relationship with another woman. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Has a child through that woman, which he wasn't really supposed to do. But in, in the course of through this, Abraham has moments of tremendously high faith and tremendously low lows. And like I said, just like each one of us, and ultimately, we find ourselves in this process 25 years later when God has promised to him, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you with a child, not just a child, a specific child through your wife, Sarah. And this is the moment when we find out it's a boy. Genesis 21.1. Now, the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave him the name Isaac to the son. Sarah bore him, and when his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, yet I have borne him a son in his old age. I want to give you some insights this morning, hopefully that you will write down on God and his promises. The first one is this. God is a promise keeper. Would you say that with me? God is a promise keeper. Would you turn to your neighbor and tell them that? God is a promise keeper. Tell them God is a promise keeper. I want you to notice this because it is, in, it is super important. In verses 1 and 2 of what we just read, it said these words. Now, the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said. Okay, God had made a promise earlier already to them, you're going to have a child. And the Lord did for Sarah, did you catch this? What he had promised. And Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had what? Promised him. The truth is, when the scripture points out the same thing three times, as he said, as he promised, as he promised, it's trying to tell us something. God is faithful to his word. He's faithful to do the very things that he says he is going to do. The scriptures tell us that God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. He is committed. He is faithful. As a matter of fact, the scriptures tell us that God is faithful even when you and I are faithless. Why? Because he cannot disown his very nature. He is a promise-keeping God. Somebody has said that there are roughly 7,400 promises in the Bible. And I'd like to go with you through each one of those, right? No, no, I'm just kidding. We can't verify that. But there are definitely thousands upon thousands of promises in the Scripture. Some of them have already been fulfilled by God to specific individuals. Some of them are yet to come in the future. And some of them are present for you and I right now. And I want to take just a brief moment to talk because I, I hear Christians a lot of times quoting verses, claiming promises, and maybe even for some of us in here, if we're honest, you're frustrated with God because you're like, I'm claiming promises that you aren't fulfilling. And I want to bring some clarity to promises of Scripture. There are, there are a couple types of promises. The first differentiation is there are specific versus universal promises in the Bible. Would you just say that with me? Specific versus universal promises. There are specific promises in the Bible. One of those is what we just read. A specific promise was that Sarah, in her old age, at the age of 90, would be having a child. Now, I can't just take that verse and come up to every 90-year-old in church and say, do you want a baby? Perfect. Read that scripture. It's for you. It was for her specifically. God commanded Joshua, march around the walls. Give it a scream after you are marching, and the walls of Jericho will come down. That does not mean that we just claim, I don't like that business. I'm going to march around that, and we're going to yell, and it's all going to come crumbling down. It doesn't work that way. It's very specific. There were things given to David, things that were given to the disciples in Jesus' time that were specific for them. That's their promises to claim. But there are also universal promises that we can all claim. Let me give you some of those. If we confess with our sins, God is faithful and he is just and he will forgive us and he will purify us from all unrighteousness. 
That's a universal promise to every single one of us in this room. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up underneath it. Isn't that good news? Now, a lot of people use that verse and say, God will never give me more than I can handle. That's not what that verse says. Let me be clear. Has anybody ever been in a spot where you're like, God, you give me way too much than I can handle, right? That happens. What it does say is God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And when you are tempted, there's always an exit door somewhere if you're looking for it. That's a universal promise to all of us. Very, very, I tell you, whoever hears these words of mine and believes him who has sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. That is a universal promise. We, we think of promises like God gave to Joshua. Joshua, do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And you said, well, that seems, can I claim that? Yes, you can. You want to know why? Because in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says these words, have Having believed you were marked with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is our deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the day of Christ Jesus. God has branded you. He has put a piece of himself by his spirit into your life. Everywhere you go as a follower of Jesus, you know who's with you? Jesus is. Some of you are like, that's terrifying. No, it should be amazing. He is with you to encourage you, to inspire you, to challenge you, to motivate you, at times to convict you, yes, to say, don't do it, don't do it. He is there with us. And these are universes. Does this make sense? Specific versus universal promises. So we can't just run to the Bible and say, well, God said it, and I'm claiming it for my own life. The second thing is this. There are conditional versus unconditional promises. Conditional versus unconditional promises in the scripture that we see. The conditional promises are usually if-then statements. If you will do this, we see this throughout the Old Testament with the nation of Israel. If you will obey my words, I will bless you. If you will do these things, I will pour out blessings upon your life. We see that time and time again. There's actually some of that in, if you go to the book of James. If any of you lacks wisdom, anybody in here lack wisdom? Anybody at all? The person next to you, yes. So the, 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 anybody lacks wisdom? This is what James says. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should or she should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to them. But when they ask, they must believe and not doubt, because he or she who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not believe they will receive anything from the Lord. They are double-minded. Do you hear the condition in that? If you lack wisdom, what should you do? Ask. If I ask, God will give. But when he gives, I need to trust him. If, then. Do you see that? Then there are other ones that are unconditional promises. God is just going to do what God is going to do. And in this moment, it's with Abraham. It doesn't matter, Abraham, how great you are. It doesn't matter if you do this perfectly. I have made a decision, and I'm going to fulfill my promise that you're going to have a son. And he fulfills that. And we see it. We see moments like this, too. They're unconditional promises. I know it's been changed in our culture in our day, but a rainbow in case you don't know what the rainbow actually signifies, it is that God will never destroy the earth with a flood again. That is what that symbol is. And that is a sign of God's covenant to Noah and to every single one of us else in this room. It is his unconditional promise from that day forward. We see it time again. Can I read to you one more promise, an unconditional one? It says this, brothers and sisters in 1 Thessalonians 4, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again and we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him according to the Lord's word. We tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep for the Lord himself will come down from the heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first and after that we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we will be with with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That is the unconditional promise of God. He is going to do that, and those events are going to happen. Anybody excited about that day? I tell you what, I am. So here's the reality. God is a promise-keeping God. The second thing I want, well, out of that, I want you to notice something that happens next in verses 3 and 4. So it says that after this is fulfilled and Sarah gives birth to a child, Abraham gives him the name Isaac, 
to the son that Sarah bore him. And when his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him to do. If you look back just a couple of chapters previously, we talked about circumcision briefly and and the details of that, that God had set that up as a process for Abraham, as a covenant for his people. And Abraham is obedient. Now, can I tell you this? Isn't it really easy to be obedient to God when he does something fulfilling in your life? It's like, oh, of course I'll do that. You know when it's challenging? When God says, I promise you in the future if you will do this now. And for some of us today, God is promising some things in your future, but you're not making the decision now to align your life with his promises. Abraham obeys, and I just want to make this note. My obedience demonstrates that I trust in God's promises. You want to know if you trust God? Look at your obedience track record. Do I trust him enough to obey what he's asking me to do? God blesses Abraham with a son in his old age, And the first thing that he does, he goes, I'm going to name him Isaac because God called me to do that. I'm going to circumcise him on the eighth day because God called me to do that. It's easy to obey God when everything's going great and we're like, yes, this is awesome. In a moment, we're going to find out Abraham hits a low. It's tougher to obey God and trust in his promises when my emotions aren't running high and I'm struggling. And that's really where the crux of the matter is. Do I trust you, God, even when it doesn't make sense to me or my emotions aren't fulfilling this? Number two, God's promises are fulfilled on his timetable. God's promises are fulfilled on his timetable. Most of us don't really like that. We think, anybody here think that God's not working fast enough in your life? Of course, most of us, right? We go through the drive through we go to Starbucks, wherever you go, you want it now, you want it filled up, you want it everything, and that's how we operate in our relationship with God. And look at what happens. Abraham was how old? He's 100 years old when his son Isaac is born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. She thinks it's funny. As a matter of fact, you guys remember what the name Isaac means? Laughter. It's funny. It really is funny. And she added, who would have said that Abraham, to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Remember up to this point, she's been barren. She's never had a child. She's 90 years of age. Yet I have borne a son to him in his old age. I just want you to pause for a moment because I think most of us, we read the Bible. I, I just Let's give a modern illustration of this. Imagine right now we're all sitting here. The doors in the back open up. You hear it, right? And this lady comes walking in, and she's old. You know she's old. And she's got a, a, a baby carriage thing, right, a stroller. And she's walking in real slow. Part of it is she needs it to keep her balance. The other part of it is she's got a baby in there. And behind them, they come walking through the door. Somebody's really gracious back there. A greeter's like, hey, can we help you find a seat? And she's like, that would be great, right? And she's rolling in, and her husband's behind her. He's got a walker because he's not walking so well either. And you can tell they're very, very, very old. And they have a seat in the back. They don't want to disrupt anybody. She says something like, hey, just in case this little one of mine gets reckless, I'm going to, then I can go outside. And we find him a seat in the back. But for, for whatever reason, the child starts making some commotion. And you all turn around, and you look at him, and you're like, Oh, what great, great grandparents those are. They're so nice to take that little child out and be here. That's incredible. And somebody comes up uh, very politely, one of the, the ushers, and says, you know what, we've got a video screen. I know that little baby of yours. And she goes, oh, my baby, it's so great. And he goes, your, your baby? That's your grand, great, great grandchild? Great, great, great grandchild? Oh, and no, 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 this is my child. Now nah, he's a week old, you know. And she's like, and, and I, I got to nurse him, you know. And he, that's why he's grumpy. And oh, well, we've got a nursing, a nursing mother's room for you. And the, yeah, you can go ahead and, and use that. And she's like, well, can you help me up, Sonny? Right? And so he gets up and she's like, I got to feed him and change a diaper. Oh, well, do you have baby food? Yeah, I got the baby food for him. I got to change my own diaper. Well, I mean, whatever, right? <laughs> this is crazy. You know this. It would be so wild. She's mashing up baby food. She's mashing up her own no teeth left, right? I don't know what's going on. Listen, some of you ladies, there's a lady that came out, and it was so fitting. She goes, Brian, I'm going to be turning 90 here this year. And I'm looking, you being Sarah, having a baby, that doesn't compute in my mind. This is crazy because God's timetable is not often our timetable. And I just remind you, 25 years prior in Genesis chapter 12, 
25 years prior to this, listen, it says that the Lord said to Abraham, go for your country and from your people and from your father's household to the land that I will show you. And I promise you I'm going to make you into a great nation, Abraham. And I'm going to bless you. And we don't know why God's timetable isn't our timetable. But if I'm really being really honest, there's been things that I've prayed for when I was in my 20s. And this is some of the things that I think, and it may be applicable for you today. That maybe there's some things in your life that you think are God's promises for you. Maybe there's some things going on for you that you go, I, it just doesn't make sense why you wouldn't want this for my life, God, because you should. And could it be that God needed 25 years to develop Abraham into the father that he needed to be for Isaac? And could it be that God needs a few years to develop you into the type of person that he needs you to be for the situation that he's calling you to do? For the person, the spouse, the parent, the mentor, the leader in somebody else's life? Maybe God's doing a developing work in you, and that's his timetable. Maybe the issue is he's got to do a developing work in somebody around you, that they're not ready for it. And so he's got to take some time to develop a process. And are, are we willing to be patient and to wait? And maybe, maybe God's just developing some circumstances that if he blessed it with you to you now, you really wouldn't get it or it really wouldn't work out great. And I think the question mark for each one of us comes, am I willing to wait and trust on God's timing? Do you believe that God's timetable is better than your own? That's really the question. And Abraham and Sarah, we know, if you haven't been here with us during the journey, we're going to talk about it in just a minute, they didn't trust, and they made a mess out of some things that we're going to see in just a brief moment. But God's timetable is rarely my timetable. And I wonder if for some of us today, God is saying, I have a promise for you and I have blessings for your life. I just can't do it now. Will you trust me that his timing is right? The beautiful thing about this story too is that God waited until Sarah, her womb was closed, menopause was done. There was no way that it could happen because God wanted to just, I think, show up on the scene and go, watch me do what is impossible for anybody else to do so that he's going to get the praise for it. And maybe that's what God wants to do in your life. He wants to receive praise out of what he's going to do. And his time is always, his timing is always perfect. The third thing is this. God's promises rarely erase my self-imposed problems. Let me say that one more time. God's promises rarely erase my self-imposed problems. Would you do me a huge favor? Turn to that neighbor again and go, this part's for you. Just tell them that. This part's for you. It's for you. And here's what I'm going to get to. Because up to this point, we're having this celebration. A child's been born. Sarah's like, Isaac is his name. This is awesome. People are going to laugh with me. The 90-year-old lady's got a baby. And she gave it to the 100-year-old guy. I mean, this is amazing stuff, right? But now there's a, a party going on that we're going to read about. A dysfunctional party. Some of you are going to experience this in about two weeks. You're going to have your own dysfunctional party. But this is a, a dysfunctional party in the Bible. And in verse 8, it says this. The child grew and was weaned. Usually this happened at about three years old in the time of Abraham and Sarah. And this process was a, a moving from a nursing mother to regular food. It was a big deal because the mortality rate for kids was fairly high. And so the child is weaned, and on that day, Isaac was weaned. Abraham held a great feast. Oh, man, it's party time. This is incredible. He is probably roughly three years old. This is an amazing day. The son of the promise is here. God, this is your, and this is all so amazing. And they, I'm sure Abraham pulled out the best stuff, right? He called all the friends, all the neighbors. They've got fatted calf over there. They've got lamb chops over there. They've got but whatever's going on, maybe a pinata for the day. You know, this is a fiesta. I mean, they are celebrating their boy. Everybody dancing, music. It's a big, big ordeal. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham was mocking. He's making fun of Isaac. Now, if you weren't here and haven't been with here, or you're wondering who on earth is Hagar and who is this son that they're talking about, several chapters back, roughly about 14 years 
well, at this point, 16, 17 years prior to this moment. Abraham and Sarah were struggling to have a child. They were waiting on God's promise, but God's timetable wasn't fast enough. And so Sarah got a great idea, and she said, hey, honey, why don't you sleep with my maidservant, and you can have a relationship with her, have a child, and that will be the son that God promised us, which was a common practice of the day. Abraham said, I'll take one for the team, and I'll do that for us, babe. And he does that, and they have a child. But it's not the way that God designed them to have a child. They made a decision without God's permission, and it's going to end up being a big, big problem. Now that boy, Ishmael, is roughly 16, 17 years of age. Isaac, the child of the promise, is about three. And we don't know exactly what he was doing. Probably something like this. <laughs> Look at that outfit, that dumb kid. He looks, at, and it's sibling rivalry, right? He'd been dad's favorite because he'd been the only one. And now he's competing with a brother from another mother. <laughs> I just came up with that on the fly. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> he's competing with a brother who's stealing all the, the affection in the show and who now has the inheritance that he thought he deserved look at that kid look at how he eats his food look at that outfit they got him in what a dorky look at, he looks funny and look at what happens next oh Isaac mom she gets mad and she says to Abraham Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son, Isaac. And the matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. I got to be honest with you. This is like an episode of Cops to me, right? Let me, let me explain to you. Hey, there's a disturbance at what whatever address, right? And all of a sudden, the cop pulls up. Hey, anybody in there? And the tent opens up, and this guy walks out. Hey, man, what's going on, man? What's, what's happening? And the cop's like, uh, we got a call for a little bit of a yelling and some disturbance in here. Yeah, yeah, we're just having a little party here celebrating my boy getting weaned and my wife's here. And he's like, oh, the cop's like, hey, okay, then what seems to be the problem, sir? Well, you know, my wife and my three-year-old, we were having the party. Everything's going great. But then, my, you know, my girlfriend over there, who I got to... Her son starts making fun of my son. Well, but that's my son over there, too. And you, you can see this is crazy talk, right? And a cop's going, what are we doing? Can I tell you this? If you came from a dysfunctional family, there is hope for all of us, right? <laughs> God uses dysfunctional people and dysfunctional families to do incredibly powerful, righteous things. And I want to give you and offer you that hope this morning. But God's promises rarely erase my self-imposed problems. It's coming back to bite him. And he thought, you know what? And have you ever been there? God, forgive me of that. I knew I shouldn't be doing that. But if you just take away the consequences of that, I promise you I will never do that again. God, I know I made some bad financial decisions there, but if you just put a check in the mail for $2,000, right, to pay this off, I promise I'll never do that again. Those words that I spoke, and I know I should have kept my mouth shut, but if you just fix all that, and, and we treat God almost like a police officer, right? You ever been pulled over? Probably not you, but you get pulled over and the cop comes up, and for some of us here, we've, we've developed a fantastic skill at this. And the cop says, you do know you're going 67 in a 45 mile an hour. Is there a reason for that? Oh, no, officer. And some of you are like, no, officer, right? Or whatever you do. <laughs> Whatever you do, and those are the words you say. So I didn't realize that. But if you let me go, I promise I'll never do it again. Right? I got a cop friend uh, years ago. This is, I don't know why I'm sharing this with you, but just uh, he was a cop up in Reading, Highway Patrol. And I was asking him, his name was Jeff. I said, Jeff, I, I know sometimes you let people off. How does that work with you? He goes, you know, Brian, my system's a little bit different. You know, a lot of, a lot of cops let the, let the pretty girls off. He goes, uh, my system is a little bit different than that. I write a ticket to every pretty girl, and it's the ones that aren't so good looking. I let them go. I was like, really? He's all, yeah. I was like, well, that's, that seems really nice of you, man. That's, that's really cool, except that I started to think about it. If you were a lady and you got pulled over, it's like a lose-lose no matter what, right? <laughs> He's all, yeah, I'm, I'm writing you a ticket. You're like, dog, I got to pay the fine. And then he goes, oh, no, go ahead and go. You're like, oh, Wait a minute, right? I'm not a good-looking lady, right? So my point in all of this, 
when we get into our relationship with God, there are some of us in here, you've experienced the grace of God that he has erased the consequences. Most of the time, that's not how it goes. And Abraham's in this moment. Did you catch what it says at the end here? The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. And you see, the problem is a lot of us, we love Jesus being our Savior. We struggle with Jesus being the Lord. And we love Jesus saving us from our problems, saving us from our sins, saving us from the mess. But we struggle saying, Jesus, you can be the Lord of my life. And the difference is, when Jesus is my Lord, we ask him first about the decisions that we should be making. When Jesus is just my Savior, we just ask him to fix the decisions that we've already made. Man, that's pretty good. And I want to let you know, Jesus doesn't want to just be your Savior today. He wants to be the Lord of your life. That before we get going down roads like Abraham and Sarah, of sleep with my maidservant and it'll all be great. You know the one thing that we never saw in that passage? God, what should we do? Because we want you to be the Lord of our lives. And I wonder if there may be some of us here today that quite honestly, we keep asking Jesus to fix our messes rather than Jesus, give me direction and how and how, what decisions you want me to make for the rest of my life. Can I give you a quick one real quick? Christmas season's coming up, and there's the tendency for some of us that maybe financially we're struggling, but we want to buy gifts for everybody, and the old saying, right, we spend money we don't have to buy stuff we don't need to impress people we don't even really like, and we package it all up, we give it to people, we give, and then we know some, because, you know, you're just as wretched as me. You're like, well, this person's probably going to give me a gift about this much, so I'm going to spend about this much to give them a gift back, right? And you go through the whole process, and then January comes, and you know what comes in January? Oh, you guys know this story. <laughs> and we do something like this, God, I really blew it. Can you get me out of this one? Because all these bills are now here. Instead of, Lord, give me some directions on the front end here to spend wisely. Because it's not just a genie moment to fix all the problems that we've created. His promises rarely erase my self-imposed problems. Last thing, experiencing God's promises requires releasing my plans. This is what I want to end with because it's really important. Would you just say this with me? Experiencing God's promises requires releasing my plans. This matter it deeply impacted and stressed out Abraham. And if we continue with the story, it says, but God said to him, don't be distressed about your boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you because it is through Isaac that your offspring are going to be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, which if you remember, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, Ishmael's offspring, the Arab people. Isaac's offspring, the Israelite people. Are we still seeing the consequence of that decision today? Yes, we are, because it doesn't erase the problems we make. He will also be developed into a nation because he is your offspring. And then catch what happens in verse 14. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water, and he gave them to Hagar, and he set them on her shoulders and sent her off with the boy. It's time to go, Hagar. And it is such a fitting picture, right? Ishmael and Hagar was all of Abraham and Sarah's plans. Isaac is God's plan. And the problem for some of us is we want to try and live with those things being compatible. And we hit this moment just like Abraham and Sarah did with Hagar and Ishmael and Isaac. It's like this cannot keep on happening any longer. And, and we feel turmoil. We feel this stress. Well, I've got a great plan, God, but I sense that this is your plan. Can't they just kind of dovetail together? Can't we just weave this, kind of make this happen? And God says, listen, you want to experience the fulfillment of my promises in your life, the blessings that I want to pour out on you, you might have to release your plans. Because most of the time, they don't dovetail together. This is what I want to do, and we want to try and convince God this will work. God says to him, it's time. You can either stick with your plans, or you can stick with my promises, but you can't do both, Abraham. And did you catch what Abraham did? He settled everything up in the morning, gave it to Hagar, and he obeyed, trusting, God, you're going to take care of them. 
you're going to take care of my son, which would have been a horrendous decision for him. But God, I trust you in this moment to do what in my mind I can't see right now. But the two are not going to fit together. Last week I did a little illustration on cooking brownies. And if you weren't here, you will know I'm not a good cook. You don't want to eat my brownies, trust me. Uh, but with that in mind, so and when I was in college, I had a, a roommate, his name was Rodney, and Rodney's mom, on the weekends, he would go home and come back with all this food from his parents' house. She always loaded him up with food. It was great for us. But I remember on one particular occasion, he came back with these noodles, and because I'm not a, a cook, he had two different kind of noodles. He said, hey, my mom told us we, we can cook these noodles, but we have to cook them separately. We can't combine them. I think that they're eggs in one or not in the other. For some of you who know the cooking and noodles and all this stuff, you would know that. And I was like, what is your, this is what I said. I'll never forget it. What does your mom know? You can cook all that stuff together. And he says, well, that's what my mom told me. And I'm like, oh, I'm an 18-year-old college kid. I know better than your mom. Just put it all together and we'll just boil it up. And we did that, right? And we made it. I, I pulled it out. It was a total mess. Stuff was, it was falling apart. It was so, dis and this is what Rodney said to me. He said, Brian, if you do that, you're going to eat it. And I took a bite and I'm like, I, I can't do it. I will buy new noodles. I cannot do it. And the truth of the matter is, it's the same thing when we try and combine our plans with God's plans. We kind of make a mess of things. Instead of just saying, God, it's either your way or my way, and I may need to release this in my life to follow you. Can I get real practical with you this morning? I wonder if some of us in here are in a dating relationship. You're dating somebody that at the end of the day, you know, this is my plan, it can work out, but deep down inside, you know it's not God's plan for your life. But it can work, and he'll get serious about God one day, or she'll get really serious about church one day. And I think this can, are you willing to release and live in God's promises, or do you want to try and keep fulfilling your plan? Maybe for some of us, you're trying to rescue your kid all the time. They make bad decisions, and you're there being their savior when what they really need is to call upon God as their savior. And you keep feeding them money to keep taking care of the problem. And God's saying, when's the time that you're going to cut the umbilical cord and for them to grow up a little bit and to call upon him, not call upon you, and maybe to learn a little bit? Are you going to hang on to your plan and your way of doing it or God's plan? For some of us, it's moving on from relationships that aren't aiding you. You're hanging on, oh, God, they're, they're good. They're good people. They're my friends. But where they're leading you is not in a healthy place. God's plan or your plan? Maybe some financial decisions in your life. God's plan or your plan. A shift in your career path. You've been going down a certain road and God's like, why are you on there? You never asked me about that to begin with. If you catch this, Abraham, you never asked me about that to begin with. And now we're 16, 17 years later. You're still reaping the consequence. And now today, you got to make a decision. you got to let go of your plan or you got to let go of or, and seek God's plan or vice versa. For some of us, there's junk in your life that you've been struggling with for a long time. Maybe it's time to get serious with somebody. Maybe it's time to get serious with your spouse. Maybe it's time to seek some counseling. Go, I need to get some, somebody that can help me overcome this. Because you keep going, I want to be a good Christian. Sexuality before marriage, you, you moved in with one another. And you're like, you know what? I know what God's calling me to do. And today, maybe even today is a day to say, i got to let go of my plan and try and work God into it to say, God, you get to call the shots in my life. And my plan aligns with yours. Abraham got up in the morning, loaded stuff up, and said, Hagar, I care about you and I love my son. But i got to do what God's calling me to do. It's the right decision. And she moves on. And can I tell you a simple truth? Nobody can make that decision but you. Abraham had to do it. And you might have to do it, and it's hard. But my question mark is, do you want to live in God's promises? Or do you want to try to keep fulfilling your best plans? Because I believe wholeheartedly God's plans for your life are so much better than anything you can dream for yourself. As we continue the story, Abraham sends them off. It says that Hagar, in, in verse 14, wanders in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under some bushes, and then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I can't watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. Abraham's decision to move her on 
is leading to the point where my son's going to die. We're going to die out here in the wilderness. And if you remember, God made a promise to Hagar years ago that he sees her, he knows her, and that her son would be developed into a nation. And in verse 17, God heard the boy crying, and an angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, Hagar, what's the matter? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave it to the boy to drink. God was with the boy as he grew up, and he lived in the desert and became an archer. And while he lived in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him in Egypt. I say all that for some of you who, quite honestly, somebody else's decisions have led you to a desert moment. And it might be a, a spouse that wronged you. Hagar didn't come up with the plan to have a son through Abraham. Abraham and Sarah did that. She was just the recipient of it. And there are some of us in this room today that maybe, maybe you're a single mom but by no fault of your own. Your husband did some garbage. Maybe you're a single dad by no fault of your own. Your spouse wronged you. I don't know what it may be, but I want to tell you this. I believe this wholeheartedly. God sees and God hears. And he knows every detail of your life. And not only does he see and does he hear, he cares for you. He loves you right where you are at. And he has a purpose and a plan for your life. And I wonder if those same words to Hagar that he says, don't be afraid, he would say to you this morning, don't be afraid, I'm here. And if we just call on him, maybe he would reveal something. Because I don't know if you caught it, Hagar is so distressed, she did not even see the well that was right next to her. And sometimes I wonder if God's given you an answer that's right next to you, but you don't see it because you're not asking him. You're just in misery or in anxiety or maybe even in frustration instead of just saying, God, help me see I trust you in this moment, even though I didn't put myself here, that you're, you see me, you hear me, you care for me, and I'm not going to be afraid. Show me what my next steps are. And maybe God will reveal that very thing to you today. But you are loved. I want to conclude with Genesis chapter 12 because the promise of God to Abraham is really significant. It says this, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. This was 25 years before the birth of Isaac. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Because this promise that was given roughly 2,000 years ago is a promise for you and for me today. It's God's promise because he is a promise-keeping God. And if you go to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, it's all about this season right now that we celebrate with Christmas. And Matthew chapter 1, it's talking about the story of Jesus Christ being born and it gives the lineage of him and it takes it back to David. It takes it back all the way to a boy by the name of Isaac because it takes it back to a man by the name of Abraham, because God made a promise to him and said, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Because through the son Isaac came other sons, other children, who ultimately led to the Savior, Jesus Christ, being born. And the promise that is universal for all of us is John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever, did you catch that? Whoever. It doesn't matter if you're male or female, old or young, black or white, you've been in church all your life, you never stepped foot in the church ever a day in your life. You've been living perfectly or you've been living a mess. You came from a functional family or a really dysfunctional home. It doesn't matter. And whoever would believe in him shall not perish but will have eternal life. That because of a promise-keeping God, he gives you and I a promise that if we will receive what Jesus Christ has done for us as the Savior of the world, that he died on the cross for your sins and for mine. You have the promise of an eternal life with him forevermore, that your sins have been forgiven, that your relationship is restored with him, that a a portion of him that God pours his spirit onto your life and that he has promises that he's going to fulfill throughout the rest of your days because of a promise he made to a man, Abraham, almost 4,000 years ago. 
because we serve a promise-keeping God. My question is, have you received that promise today? Can you claim that promise that your sins are forgiven because you have received what Jesus Christ has done for you? And if you've never done that, I'm going to give you an opportunity in just a moment to make that decision, maybe for the very first time in your life. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? God, I thank you that you never fail, that your word is true. And if you say it, we can always count on it. And Lord, that sometimes looks a little different than what we anticipate or even may expect. But you fulfill your word in your timing, your way. And I thank you that you are trustworthy. God, for some of us in here today that are struggling, maybe with the timing of this, I pray that there would be a moment of rest, a moment of trusting in you, a moment of maybe seeing a bigger picture that you are working out details that we could never see or imagine because you're just a whole lot smarter than we are. And that in the waiting, it would demonstrate our trust in you, that you're in control, and that we believe that you are a promise-keeping God. Father, for others of us who maybe we're in here right now and we've treated you more like a police officer who's just here to cancel our tickets, I pray that we would be so much more than that, that we would genuinely make you the Lord, not just our Savior, that the decisions that we make in life, we want to live in your promises and the fulfillment of your blessings, so help us in that journey, I pray. God, as I think of just this moment of letting go of our plans like Abraham had to do, this plan B to pursue you fully. I got to believe that there are some of us in here today that we're hanging on. I pray that you, in a way that only you can, would speak into our hearts and into our lives to trust that your plan is so much better. And God, that we would have the courage to take that step, the obedience to take that step. And maybe you're here right now and with our eyes closed, this whole idea of a God of promises and really receiving that and knowing him, it's, it's foreign to you. But there's something that God is stirring in your heart right now to say there's, there's more to your life than what you're experiencing because he has created you for more. And that starts with a relationship with him. And if you would say today, you don't even know if you have a relationship with God because you've never received what Jesus Christ did for you in dying on the cross, you can settle that right here, right now by starting that journey with a simple prayer like this in your heart, maybe to repeat after me, God, I need you. I want your promises and your blessing in my life. And so today, I realize and acknowledge I'm a sinner. But I ask you to forgive me. And I believe that you will because you say that you will. And I believe that, Jesus, you died on the cross for my sin, for me. So come into my life. Give me a brand new start today. And help me to continue to experience the promises, your promises, for the rest of my days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.